Only one gram of this substance could paralyze and kill 83 million people, the entire population of Germany. But despite this, it is still used in the medical field. We're talking about the most powerful poison known to man, the botulinum toxin. Hi guys, I'm Dena, and today in this video we'll take a close look at the biochemical aspects of the most potent toxic substance in the world, the botulinum toxin. Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. 1793 Baden-Württemberg, Germany. Six people died after eating pork sausages, which are typical to the region. Other cases of poisoning followed, and since then, sausage poisoning has been known as botulism, from the Latin botulus, sausage. No one had yet understood what the real cause was. Only 25 years later, the German doctor Justinus Kerner realized that botulism was caused by a substance that acts on the nervous system, but it was not clear where this substance came from. It was only in 1895 that Emily van Ermingham, a Belgian biologist, managed to identify the microorganism that caused botulism, the Clostridium botulinum bacterium. In the absence of oxygen, this bacterium can proliferate and release the world's most powerful, naturally occurring poisonous substance, the botulinum toxin. What you see here is its molecular structure. It is a very large molecule, and one that has the ability to cleave or cut specific proteins, as if it were a pair of scissors. Keep this property in mind because it will be helpful later in the video. It's hard to believe, but a mere 12 nanograms of this substance is all it takes to kill a person. So that's 0.0000012 grams. But just why is the botulinum toxin so lethal? Well, to put it simply, in just a few days, the toxin manages to paralyze the respiratory muscles, thus preventing lung inflation, and we die of asphyxiation, meaning we die because our bodies can't get enough oxygen. Now let's look in biochemical detail at how this toxin, the botulinum toxin, works. To understand how the toxin acts on our muscles, we must first understand how our brain is able to send impulses to the muscles in order to move. Basically, motor neurons are what connect our brains to our muscles. What you can see here are the muscles, while up here we have the motor neurons. Look, inside them there are these little spheres that contain messenger molecules called neurotransmitters, which allow the muscles to contract. The small spheres then attach themselves onto these green appendages, known as snare proteins, which allow the sphere to open and the messenger molecules to cross over and reach the muscle. And so, this is how the muscle is able to contract. Basically, the little sphere is like a ship full of goods, the messenger molecules, and to unload at the port, it must first attach itself to the dock, that is, to the snare proteins. So you can see that without the snare proteins, without these arms, without the dock, the messenger molecules can't cross over and the muscle won't contract. And it is exactly on these that the botulinum toxin acts. When we eat something in which Clostridium botulinum, so the bacterium, has grown, the substances we ingest, including the toxin, pass through the stomach, reach the intestine, and enter the bloodstream. Once they're in the blood, they can reach the muscles and therefore the motor neurons. Let's take a close look at the motor neuron. This is the botulinum toxin. Once ingested, the toxin can enter the motor neuron by embedding itself into a vesicle, the small sphere you see. Here the toxin then divides and a part of it leaves the vesicle. Do you remember what I said earlier about the property the protein had of acting like scissors? Here this portion of toxin is starting to cut the snare proteins, the arms that are used to pass on information. The vesicles containing neurotransmitters are no longer able to attach to the snare proteins, the signal does not pass, and muscle contraction can no longer occur. Without muscle contractions we can't move the muscle, we can't breathe, and we die. The toxin then continues to circulate uninterrupted around the body, and in just a few days all muscles cease to contract, including the diaphragm, the muscle responsible for respiration, and we consequently die of asphyxia. However, it takes some time for all the muscles to become completely blocked at least a week, and the first symptoms such as blurred or double vision, dilated pupils, or difficulty in keeping our eyelids open occur after 12 to 72 hours. So if treated quickly with the help of an antidote, we can recover from this disease without too many problems. 
So is it something I should be worried about? I mean, how can I be sure that what I'm eating doesn't contain the botulinum toxin? Well, in general, we can rest easy. In Italy today, there are very few cases of botulism. We're talking about approximately 20 cases per year. And the majority of these originate from home canned foods, such as pickled vegetables or vegetables in oil, or olives in brine and jams or preserves. This is because it's possible that they're not all prepared in line with safety standards, so not in the correct way one which would prevent the proliferation of bacteria. While at an industrial level, safety procedures now follow very high standards and products are safe. So, due to the strict regulations, we can trust in the safety of supermarket foods, but when making canned goods at home, it's important we follow the proper guidelines. Guys, I forgot something very important, rightly so. Under what conditions does botulinum toxin develop? So the Clostridium botulinum can survive and multiply only if the conditions are favorable. In the case of jams and preserves, botulism could occur when the sugar concentration is below 50%. Therefore, if the jam is not very sweet, bacteria can thrive due to the absence of sugar, leading to their proliferation. As for vegetables in brine, that is under salt, if the salt percentage is below 10%, if the water is not salty enough, the bacteria can survive, can proliferate. And regarding pickled preserves, if the pH is not sufficiently low, so if the environment is not acidic enough, the bacteria can continue to proliferate and grow. To summarize, our task is to create an inhospitable environment for the bacteria by introducing ample amounts of sugar, salt, vinegar, or any acidic substance. Okay, now that we've understand how the toxin works from a biochemical perspective, why is it still used in medicine? When it was discovered that the botulinum toxin can act on motor neurons and block a muscle, scientists began to exploit this characteristic to treat a whole series of diseases such as strabismus, spasticity, and involuntary muscle contractions, such as involuntary eyelid contractions. In aesthetic medicine, injections, also known as botulinum toxin infiltrations, are used to reduce and smooth expression lines, such as frown lines, the vertical ones that form between our eyebrows, or the wrinkles on the sides of our eyes known as crow's feet, and forehead lines too. The toxin is injected locally to paralyze and relax the muscles responsible for the lines. The interesting thing about this treatment is that it allows you to temporarily have a relaxed, smooth, and wrinkle-free face without resorting to surgery. I said temporarily because the effect wears off after about six months and injections therefore need to be repeated periodically. Clearly, very low doses are used, at least 1,000 times lower than the lethal dose in order to avoid any serious or permanent harm. And in any case, as with any other medication, Botox treatments can potentially cause side effects. So that's the tale of the most potent poison known to man. I think it gives us a lot of food for thought. Even the most dangerous substances, once they have been studied in depth from a scientific point of view, can potentially become useful to humankind. A perfect example of Paracelsus' motto, all things are poisons, for there is nothing without poisonous qualities. It is only the dose which makes a thing poison. Thanks for watching. As always, see you again here on Geopop Everyday Science. Alla prossima.